tonight, my sister Stephanie and I, um, we get to do something special. We get to introduce one of our heroes. Uh, ever since we were very little, we've admired our grandfather. Um, we've gone to hear him speak all through the years, and we never get tired of hearing him. And we're very glad to hear him again tonight. So... Tonight, Ronnie and I are very honored to introduce you to our poppy, Ron Halverson Sr. That's pretty nice, isn't it? Poppies, that's me. I'm uh, honored to be here for this weekend because it's about prayer. Now, I'm not going to be talking about monastic type praying this week, so if you're, you know, into this uh, quiet monastic. Like we sung Amazing Grace. <laughs> I felt sorry for John Newton. <laughs> I mean, anyway, I, you know, I'm used to the old, you know, bang it away. But I was introduced to prayer by a prayerless mother. My mother didn't go to church. She wasn't a Christian, but she introduced me to prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless Mama, Daddy, Grandpa, Grandma, Grand... And finally fell asleep. <laughs> but the first real prayer, the first prayer where I touched the face of God, the first prayer where I felt that I was ushered into heaven was in a stolen boat. Now, I knew it was stolen because I stole it. And a storm came up, and um, water started coming in the boat. My brother was there, and, and uh, he said, uh, bail. And so I took off my motorcycle boot, and I was trying to bail his boat out. And we were out there in Gravesend Bay out near the uh, Hudson, where the Hudson East River come in through the Narrows and then sweep out on Coney Island and out in the Atlantic Ocean. And, and the water was coming in faster than I could bail it. So my brother says, get that water out. I said, you bail, and I'll row. And, and just as I started to row, the tide changed. And one foot forward and three feet back. I fell down in my boat, which wasn't my boat, and I prayed my first prayer. I mean the prayer that touched the face of God. God, get me in, and I'll be good. Now, he knew better than that. But at that moment, the sky was torn apart, the storm, and sun came down in that boat, and there was a speedboat coming by and hooked on and towed us in, and I got my feet on the ground. It wasn't long before I forgot that prayer, and you know that prayer, the emergency-type prayer. You know, there's no atheists in sinking boats <laughs> or crashing planes. When a death angel moves around your heart, you're going to ask the question, where are you going to spend eternity? That's the question. This week, I want to take you into the area of praying, a different area, a different level. I want to talk about warfare praying. I was born fighting. I've been fighting now the devil for 50-some years, and I'll go out fighting. But I learned a new level of praying, intercessory praying, warfare praying. I wrote a book on prayer called Warf Prayer Warriors. And how many read that book? Let me see your hands. Well, there's some literates at this college. <laughs> I mean, they give you all kinds of authors to read, but Ron Halverson, can you imagine that? Anyway, I wrote a book on warfare praying, and I want to share with you this weekend at this level. We're gonna, it's going to build an uh, excitement as we look at what intercessory prayer can do what warfare praying going up against the enemy i mean drawing a, la a, a line in the sand and saying devil that's as far as you're going now the power of god is going to take over from here we're going to see mighty things we're living in the last days we need last day praying and so i'm going to talk about that tomorrow revival and renewal you see this church will ever have a revival or a funeral and it's up to you and me We'll either have a revival or a funeral. And so I hope you'll stay with us this weekend. 
Saturday afternoon I have a seminar on warfare praying and how it's scriptural, biblical, and I'm going to show you the, what God expects of us today in a war against the evil one, a war against the devil. And then I'm going to show you how to take cities back for God through prayer walking, one of the most exciting things of witness that I've ever found in my own spiritual life. And I'm going to share with you some great miracles here in North America. And my ministry has been not in the farmland. I've been here, but mine has been in the cities of America. And I'm going to share with you what we did to, to cover the areas of the, some of the great cities and praying for the outpouring of God's Spirit and how God moved in mighty ways and conversions, powerful conversions. You'll hear mission stories here in North America, there in the inner cities that you don't hear even in a mission field. And so I want you to stay with us and, and the afternoon. Then we're going to end that service with the anointing, the laying on of hands as they did in Scripture. And I want to pray for you individually. Pray that God's Spirit will fill you and you'll go from this place empowered by the Holy Ghost. Do you know what this church could do if we were empowered by the Holy Ghost? If we didn't approach the Holy Ghost just as Holy Ghost 101, a study in the Holy Ghost, but experience the Holy Ghost? Would you know what it would be like if we experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that God would do through us as a church to finish the work of God? And so I want to share with you an exciting weekend, and I hope you'll be with us and, and, and take a part of this. And I know that by the end of the weekend, I know by the end of the weekend that you will say, God, it's been good to be in this place, and we've received a blessing. Now let's bow our heads in a word of prayer, and I want to introduce you to the war. Let's bow our heads now in prayer. Father God, I pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit to us here tonight. It's not by the words we speak as preachers but by the Spirit in which we speak them. And so I pray for the inpouring of the Spirit of God in my life. Open me to the movings of your Spirit. May I sense your Spirit. And Father, may they sense your Spirit as well, that every person might be touched by God's Spirit tonight in his name. Amen and amen. By the way, you can say amen. I come from a... Good line of ameners. We're at war. The battle is raging in every corner of the globe. Africa feels it. Tribal retribution, ethnic cleansing. We're at war. The Sudan, the Congo, the Rwanda, Kenya, Europe feels it. Bosnia, I mean Kosovo, ethnic cleansing, terrorist attack in Holland and in India, and England feels the bombing on buses and in the tubes of the subway system. Terrorism is real. We are at war. North Korea, communism, sacrificing millions through hunger, caring more about some ideological idea than about people. Indonesia feels it. Muslims killing Christians, burning churches to the ground. I mean, the Middle East feels it. We are at war. Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Israel, Palestine. We are at war over religion, over oil, over bombings and mortar attacks. America feels it. New York feels it and felt it when the terrorist attack on 9-11. Washington felt it when there the bombing of the Pentagon and a terrible scar on the minds and the sadness that burns in our souls as Americans. We are at war. It's unsafe for our children to walk home from school in America. We are at war. It's unsafe for our women to jog for their health or to walk in parking lots or to take a stroll in the neighborhood at night. We are at war. It is unsafe for babies to be born in a modern culture, to meth mothers and to crack fathers and to drunken parents. It is unsafe for our children to go to school. We are at war. Unsafe for an embryo to grow in the womb of a so-called liberated woman. We are at war. America feels it in its inner cities, and we feel it here even in the farmlands of mid-America. A man is arrested in a, in a small New York town for selling cocaine, confessed he had traded drugs for sex, and infected at least a hundred high school girls in that little town. We are at war. 
A teenage girl gives birth to a baby in a restroom in a high school and lays the baby in the trash can to go out and dance with her boyfriend to her favorite tunes while the baby dies. We are at war. We are a nation on, in disaster. We are a nation about to fall. We are a world doomed, damned, crushed, and bound for hell. And we sit around picnic praying. Living in our comfort zone while the world perishes. We are at war. In Kentucky, a boy caught up in the occult open fire in a group of high school girls who were praying in the high school hallway, praying to the God, the God that they love, Jesus Christ, killing three of them. Columbine, Virginia Tech, other schools are under siege. Listen, three separate cases, juries convicted mothers of drowning, smothering, beating their children to death. We are at war. People in high places with low morals. We are at war. Government officials, even presidents, have been accused of lying, sexual escapades, obs- obstructing justice. We live under a mo- we live not under moral law any longer, but under situational, sociological law, which is based upon what certain group thinks is good enough, and it's good enough for the people. And they should follow it. When we speak about or against evil today, when we stand up to speak out openly and candidly, we are attacked. When we call, when we talk about moral change in a nation or we talk about moral change in the church, we are attacked. Listen to me. We are at war. Liberty turned into license threatens our entire way of life in America. America is at war. And this battle is going on in our homes. I mean, divorce rates spirals out of control. I mean, listen to me. One in two marriages end in divorce. Half of those who remain married are unhappy. Couples now live together. Relationship unions, they call it. You have a red car. I have a red car. We have something in common. Let's live together. (laughs) We're at war. Nickel and then see what that relationship when it ends in the court fighting over nickels and dimes over half the stereo set cut it in half and then look for a new relationship we're at war we're at war with the devil and the devil is at war with the church and the devil is at war with this nation and listen to me there's a battle also in the church The church is not immune from the problems afflicting our culture. During the last 50 years, the church has slipped from its high moral ground, where it spoke and it did not stutter, where the Ten Commandments were not ten suggestions, where we preached the Word of God and stood upon the Word of God and were faithful to the Word of God. I think we as a church need to get back to the principles that we first believed in. We are at war. The faith of our fathers have grown frail and has largely been forgotten membership at its all-time high while spirituality as it at its all-time low jesus calls to be shining cities on a hill the church he says the church should be the salt of the earth you are the salt of the earth he says you are the salt that protects the, the gospel of jesus christ listen to me and yet in many cases we have made less we have been made less tolerable we have made the church less tolerable we have made the gospel boring listen we've made the gospel dull we've made it tasteless the fanatics try to rob us of our joy as christians and the liberals try to rob us of our service and our witness the fanatic spends all his time writing more rules and the liberal does away with the ten rules already written i mean there we are cold and uncaring and unresponsive to the needs of the culture we have members that don't want to catch fit that don't want to catch fish they just want to clean them well you'll get it by tuesday every now and then it's like casting pearls very few christian families today have daily family worship we go to church and we leave the church at the church and we happy sabbath brother halverson happy sabbath and that's the last we talk about happiness and joy for the rest of the week and here we find everywhere we fight and cuss and act dishonestly lying and hating and there's no difference between the church and the world it's like Hiroshima bonus said i looked for the church and i found it in the world i looked for the world i found it in the church 
We are at war. And listen to me, the outcome of this war is important to you. It's important to your future and important to your children and to their future. What happens these next few weeks, these next few months, these next few years shape the very destiny of this nation. And so God is calling us to battle. God is calling us to put on the armor of God. God is calling us now to go to war in the name of Jesus Christ. In my book, Prayer Warrior, in the first chapter I say this, our streets, our neighborhoods, our communities, our states, our country, our world are all battle zones. If you don't believe it, follow me into the inner Go with me to South L.A. Go with me to East L.A. Go with me to San Bernardino. Go with me to Brooklyn, New York, to Manhattan, to Mott Haven, and follow me through the streets and into the tenements if you don't believe there's a war. Follow me into the hundreds of homes and thousands of homes that I visited in in this great nation through my years in ministry and tell me we're not at war. Jim Nelson Black in his book, When Nations Die, identified 10 laws or 10 factors that led to the death of a nation. Listen to what they are. Listen carefully and learn. One, increase of lawlessness. Secondly, loss of economic discipline. Thirdly, rising bureaucracy. Fourthly, decline of education. Fifthly, weakening of cultural foundations. Sixthly, loss of respect for tradition. Increase of materialism. The rise of immorality and the devaluating of human life. The Greek culture fell. The Roman culture and the European culture is in decline and fell to ruin because of those three deadly sins. Wealth, power, and passion. We are at war. And once we discover that war, we will pray differently. Once we discover that war, we will dress in armor differently. Once we understand that war, we will pick up the sword of the Spirit and go in the name of Jesus Christ, conquering and to conquer. When we understand that war. And so I start this weekend by telling you young people, you cannot dismiss God from the culture and expect it to survive and prosper. You cannot dismiss God from a culture or from a nation. We have stamped on our coins in God we trust, and we don't trust anyone, even ourselves. We are at war. Some of you recall that in the 60s, South Korea or South Korea was devastated by war. And people cried out to God. Did you know that that war brought that nation to Jesus Christ? And that nation turned to God. And out of that belief and faith in God, praying to this God, what happened? There came a dynamic, economic, and democratic nation. While North Korea rejected God during the 60s, rejected God during that war. And what did they get? They got a nation starving their children because they're building a bomb. A bomb is more important to a nation than a baby. That's when we're at war. I went to Korea some time ago, and I said, well, if I come over and speak, I want to go to Dr. Cho's church. This Korean with 12 women, prayer for women, started a church in Seoul, Korea. And through prayer and the power of prayer, that church grew. Now there's over a million. But anyway, they bought a whole mountain with caves and there they were. They have prayer 24 hours a day, seven days a week, someone is praying in that church. What a God that would happen here in College View, 24 hours a day, someone is here at this altar praying to God for the outpouring of the Spirit. Could you imagine what God would do to Lincoln? I went there on a Wednesday morning. It was a rainy, miserable Wednesday morning. There were 18,000 people who had come to pray. They left their jobs. They got on buses. I mean, it wasn't easy for them, but they came. 18,000 people praying to God, praying for the outpouring of the Spirit, praying that they might reach soul for Jesus Christ. If I called a prayer meeting here in College View on a Wednesday morning, On a rainy day, I would at least have rain. (laughs) How many of us would give up our jobs for that morning to come and pray for the outpouring of God's Spirit? The outpouring of God's Spirit. So we're at war. 
I mean, that's definite. You and I, friend, we are at war. We need to pray as we never prayed before. We need to cry out to God as we've never cried out before. The Bible doesn't say the church is a church of preaching. It's a place of preaching. It's not a place of singing. It's a place of prayer. It's a place of prayer. So God is calling his people to arm themselves, to get ready. The battle is going to get worse. Listen to me. It's going to get worse. What happens to mankind when it excludes God from its culture? Take time to read Romans chapter 1. 19th century British historian Thomas Michele predicted that the seeds of our demise would come, not from outside barbarians, but from excessive devotion to liberty, personal freedom without strong moral boundaries. Isaiah 5, 20 through 23 talks about warfare praying. Why? Because we are at war. Why do we say this weekend we're going to talk about a new level of praying? Because we're going to take us from the monastic type of prayer to a now more aggressive type of prayer. To a prayer where we claim what God wants to give us. We ask for what God wants to give us. And he has already started giving it to us. We just have to ask for it. Do you know at this very moment as I look out at this congregation, we're going through crisis. If statistics are true... A family is going through a terrible crisis here in this church tonight. There's a family here going through a terrible crisis. It seems like there's no answer. If it's true, some child of God is discouraged here tonight. I mean despondent here tonight. Ready to give up faith. If statistics are true, some girl is losing her grip and throwing herself away. If it's true, someone is contemplating suicide in this church tonight. I'm telling you, we are at war. Some young person will decide tonight to sacrifice their virginity to lust, sobriety to drugs. I mean, we are at war. Now, I know we like pretty little sermons with bubbling brooks, positive attitudes, And pop spiritual psychology. But it's too late for that now. We're at war. The very destiny of nations. We're at war. Your future is at stake. Because we're at war. We're at war. An Adventist father came to me. In one of the cities as I was ministering. He came to me. He said, Ron, he says... Our family's devastated. I said, what do you mean? He says, my son, 16 years old, got into meth, using meth. And just the other night, he overdosed on meth. He died. The father was weeping. Father was crying. I mean, professional man. He he thought he had everything. He, He thought his son, listen, he lost his son to meth, 16 years old. It's amazing, this church, 650,000 babies are born in America addicted to drugs in a womb. And we sit around counting soybeans. Some of you vegans will get that by Friday, next Friday. 650,000 babies are born to die. And we are counting soybeans. We should be out reaching them, rescuing them, taking them from the hold of the devil and giving them freedom and giving them the peace that passeth understanding that comes from Jesus Christ alone. Can you say amen here, young people? Come on now. Can you say amen? There you go. You're not deaf. I went to San Bernardino. By the way, the brethren do this to me all the time. They go to the Philippines, president of the of General Conference. He goes to the Philippines and sends Ron to San Bernardino. <laughs> San Bernardino, by the way, is the highest crime rate in any city in America per capita. The Hell's Angels were born at San Bernardino. Satan worship in America was born in San Bernardino. And so they sent me to San Bernardino. And uh, I was there. And nights I would go out visiting. And boom, I'd be ducking behind cars, crawling my way back to my car. I think I'll make that visit tomorrow night. (laughs) The M16s. (laughs) 
And when I went to that city, I said, we need something. We need something special because we're going into the very, we're going to the very bowels of the devil, right in the very breeding ground of Satanism. And so we found our prayer walkers and our prayer warriors. We had 100, 200 prayer walkers. And we took the city. We covered the perimeters of the city in prayer. Listen to me. God was moving in a mighty way. When I gave my testimony from gangs to God, I came out of the gang. I I thought fighting was tough then. It hasn't been near as tough as fighting for Jesus Christ in this spiritual battle against the devil. And I stood, listen to me. One night I preached, I gave my testimony. And after I'd finished, there were two gangs there. I knew because they wrote their graffiti on the walls in the bathroom. But after I finished, a young man came down, 27 years old. He spent 17 years of his 27 years incarcerated. And he had all the gang tattoos, you know, that cool stuff. And he fell on my shoulder. He said, I want to be free. I want to get free. And I shared with him the gospel. The simp- I led him through the gospel. He received Christ in his life. And God came into his life. We talk about 27 fundamentally. We talk about 27 weeks. Listen to me. When the Holy Spirit moves on a heart, it's a few minutes. I found Christ as an uneducated teenager. I couldn't read or write, so I didn't read 27 Fundamental Beliefs. But I gave my heart to Christ. And listen to me, at 16, almost 17 years old, an illiterate boy from Brooklyn. When I gave my heart to Christ, I was saved right then. And listen, I'm still saved. And when Jesus comes, I'm still saved. Someone said to me, you still have that enthusiasm. I said, yeah, because I'm still saved. And by the way, you Adventists, I'm not more saved now because I've led tens of thousands of people through the baptismal waters of the church. Church of Jesus Christ. I'm not saved because I've done these wonderful Sabbath things. I'm saved because I dedicated my heart to Jesus. I gave him my soul. I said, Jesus, take me. Took a switchblade out of my pocket, hid out of my heart, put a Bible in my hand, and sent me around the world to preach the gospel. That's why I say, we are at war. And that young man gave his heart to Christ. We, we planned his baptism. Oh, I wish you had seen the light of God in his heart. The light of God in his face. And he would come each night sitting in the front row and was in my Bible class. And and we were going to have a big baptism at at Loma Linda Pool. By the way, the Holy Spirit was poured out. 390 people were baptized in the kingdom of God in San Bernardino, California. Oh, you have that all the time at this church. I can see that. Son, you never told me that was happening here. On a Thursday... He was standing with his girl. By the way, we usually have a lot of marriages and then baptisms because, you know, the culture. But anyway, he was standing on the porch and it was a drive-by shooting. Boom, blew him away. Killed him. A pool of blood. And that Friday night, I stood up before that congregation. 3,000 people come to hear the word of God. And I stood up in that congregation. I said... He's dead. I said, he had no money to bury him. I said, we're taking an offering for him. And I wanted to bury him in the nicest cemetery in Loma Linda. I wanted, you see why? Because I wanted at the resurrection, for when he comes forth with all the tattoos and all the, you know, that the saints would see what a sinner looks like, saved. (laughs) Found the best plot in that beautiful cemetery. I close my eyes. I see it right now. Laid in the rest. Hope of, I say we are at war. Satan hates us. Satan hates a believer. He'll attack your family. He'll attack you through your roommate. Listen, he'll attack you through your professors. He'll attack you, you professors. He'll attack you through your students. And so I say... We are at war. Our prayer warriors walked the streets and God moved in a mighty way. I'm going to teach you the principle and show you the miracles of what God does. Many Christians are trembling in our boots. We're acting insipid. We're so afraid. Listen to me. God needs to take that fear and turn it into faith. 
Don't let your fears overwhelm you. March on to victory with undaunted courage and be strong in the Lord, the Bible says. And here's the consolation, the word of God. The Bible says the outcome of the battle rests in God's hands, not in your skill or in your strength. We are to concentrate on the task before us, which is to be strong in the Lord. To be strong in the Lord. We need more prayers and less players. The church of Jesus Christ. We need to be strong in the Lord. By the way, Satan is real. And they don't have a red suit and a pitchfork. He's real. He's everything you want and you shouldn't have. He's in the temptation of those you love the most. And those you hate the most. The Bible tells us about this power, this force. I tell you, he's real. He's called the great, great red dragon in Revelation. He's called the old serpent, the devil, Satan, Revelation 12, 9. He's real. I know we don't hear many sermons about Satan, but he's real. He's our enemy. The Bible tells he's our adversary, 1 Peter 5, verse 8. The Bible tells he's the prince of this world, Satan. He's John 12, 31. The Bible says he's the prince of devils, Mark 3, 22. The Bible says he's the ruler of the darkness of this world, Ephesians 6, 12. Everywhere there's darkness, he's there. He's a thief, John 10.10. He's a destroyer, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10.10. He's the strong man, Matthew 12.29. He's the father of lies. You can't believe a word he says. When he tells you you're beautiful, you're not. When he tells you you're ugly, you're gorgeous. You can't believe a lie. He's a liar from the very beginning. He'll tell you this is wonderful, for this is best for you when it's worst for you. Don't believe a word he says. Because he's a liar. He's the father, the Bible says. He's the father of lies. He's the accuser of the brethren. And that's Revelation 12.10. He's a deceiver, a roaring lion. He is the enemy. That's from my book, page 31, 30 and 31. But now comes the power of prayer. I'm going to show you how how a warrior gets ready for battle. How you can get ready for battle. How you can dress in the armor of God. How you can how you can use the sword of the spirit in this great battle. In this great battle. And so there's an intervention that needs to take place. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, he thought he was going to be defeated. I want to tell you we are with the God of victory. The victory is assured. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1 through 24, we read about how the king prayed or prayed fervently in the Lord. And listen to what he says. Listen to this prayer. This should be your prayer. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of the land before the people of Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Jehoshaphat acknowledged God's power. He said God could win in a battle, remember? And you remember the story, they were outnumbered. But God says, I've given you the victory. And when they woke up in the morning to go to battle, what had happened? The victory had already been won. I want to tell you the victory is won. I just want to be in the battle. I know the outcome. I just want to be in the midst of it. I I mean, it's part of my nature. When I was a kid, I always wanted to be in the midst of the fight. Now as a preacher, I want to be in the midst of the fight. We are in these last days and we're fighting for the truth of God. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the vast army. For the battle is not yours, but it's God's. And he says, it's won. The battle. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, teenagers, listen to me. They were your age. They told, don't bow down, don't pray. Why? Because the devil hates praying. The devil hates praying. He don't mind you giving Bible studies and philosophizing and theologizing and otherizing, but he doesn't want you to pray. And remember, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they prayed. And then, then the king said, well, you're going to bow down and pray? You pray already, bow down and pray to the golden images. They said, no, we don't pray to golden images. We pray to the God of heaven. And they said, well, you can't do that. They said, well, we will do that. And they bowed down before the king and prayed to the God of heaven. And you remember what happened? Took Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, people that threw them in the fire, burned up. And they weren't even singed. Why? Because the battle had already been won. Jesus Christ was already in the fire. 
Jesus Christ was already there waiting for them. And when they came in, they said, ooh, one like unto the Son of Man. I want to tell you when I go into the streets of the cities and I go into the inner cities and I work in those streets, listen to me, I see the power of God working. I was visiting in Harlem. It was late at night. It was 9 o'clock. I want to make my last visit. I had survived the whole night. I always carried my Bible with me when I visit in the inner city. Because if they shot me, they had to go through Genesis, Exodus, Viticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You know, so I, I always... And I was running up the stairs of the tenement. It was late at night, almost 9 o'clock. And, and I always run because they can't hit a moving target very well. And, and I came by and there was this fella sitting there with a big switchblade out. When it's a switchblade, it looks that big, let me tell you. It probably was this big, but it looked that big. And he's cleaning his nails looking for a customer. So I looked around to see who his customer was going to be. All of a sudden, I realized this customer is me. And so I said, hi, how are you doing? I'm Pastor Ron Halverson. I'm out visiting the people, and I'm looking for this person. Could you help me find this person? And I lean over right by his switchblade by my face, and I said, I'm trying to find this person. You think you could help me find this person? He said, well, I'll be very happy to help you find this person. Because in those tenements, you knock and say, does John Jones live here? They don't know no John Jones. One day, I went through seven flights. Knocked on every door for seven flights before I found John Jones. But anyway, I said, would you help me? He said, yeah, I'll help you. Put away a switchblade and come help me. And I found, he found me the place. And I said, thank you very much. And God bless you. And have a good night. And, and as I was leaving that night, he was sitting there waiting for his customer. Highway, he said, good night. He said, good night. I feel and sense the power of the Spirit of God. Only white man in Harlem. Waiting for his customer. Switch blade out. Put it away. Help me to find a candidate for the kingdom of Christ. The victory is already won. I want to talk about that this weekend with you. And it's won through prayer. Through prayer. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were prayer warriors. I mean Jehoshaphat. Prayer warrior. Jeremiah, prayer warrior. Joshua, battle of Jericho, prayer warrior. If he could bring down the walls of Jericho, why can't he bring down the walls of Lincoln, Nebraska? Come on now. He's the same God. Paul, listen to me. Paul, he was on fire for God. Everywhere he went, they put him in prison. They couldn't hold him. Prison couldn't hold him. Paul was a mighty warrior for God. He went on to battle. And look what he accomplished for Christ. He was at war. He told us, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we're at war, friend. I hope you realize that. And I hope tonight you decide in your own heart that you're going to become a warrior. But there's something going to happen in your life that changes your life. This will not just be another lesson on prayer. But this will be an experience of prayer, a ministry of intercession. A man came to a camp meeting out west. He was broken. His heart was broken. He put his head on my shoulder, started crying. He says, I've lost my wife. I've lost my three children. He said, it's hopeless. I've got to go this week, the end of this week. I've got to go and, 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 and I'll be divorced. He says, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed. I said, have you walked in prayer? He said, what do you mean? I said, go to the house when your wife's not there. And walk the perimeters of the house and pray. Oh, that's the Joshua model. He said, what do I do? I said, just pray. And if God is going to intervene, he'll intervene. That Saturday night, he came running into me. He said, guess what? He said, I I did what you said. I I, I went out as a warrior. I I, I prayed the prayer. I I walked in in the perimeters of that house and I prayed, God, save my family. We've let the devil take our families from us. We've let the devil take our children from us. We've let the devil take our parents from us. Don't you think it's time we take back something for God? That family was brought and united together. I got to meet his wife before I left. And it was a wonderful experience. Listen to me. We are at war. But the victory 
is already won. Come with me to the path of God's word this weekend and learn what it is to be a warrior, to be on fire for God, to be full of the Holy Ghost, and to see great things in your life. Can you imagine what God would do if the Holy Spirit fell upon this campus? What it would be like if we walked the campus in prayer and the dorms in prayer, the classrooms in prayer. Could you imagine if we became a praying people? And that's my prayer for this weekend, that we will go together in prayer and let God work in a mighty way. In a mighty way. The warrior's preparation is pray, believe, ask, and it's done. Father, which art in heaven, I thank you for that promise that this weekend, what you've promised us this weekend, that we might come to grips with this, that we might become warriors, Father. It's been too long that we've just been sitting, watching the battle. It's now time for us to stand up, to be strong in the Lord, the power of his might, and to claim what you want to give us, and to believe you'll give it to us. For I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen and amen. God willing, tomorrow morning, I want to take you to the word of God, and I want to show you how revival comes and reformation. Remember, the church will either have a revival or a funeral. God bless you. Be real good. You leave this place, but you never leave the presence of God. He loves you. He'll go on loving you forever. Good night. God bless you. I'll see you in the morning.